<clears throat> Hello, I'm Tony Messia of the Charlotte Ledger, and I'm happy to welcome you to the second of three weekly webinars in this Business Toolbox series. It's a collaboration between the Ledger and the Employers Association Catapult. This series is designed to help small and mid-sized businesses address common challenges, and today's topic is Build a Better Workforce, How to Recruit and Retain Top Talent. That's certainly a a hot topic with the labor market um, being what it is. We'll, we'll dig into that today. And next week, just to give you a preview in our series finale, the topic is exploring healthcare options. And then last week's webinar was on avoiding legal headaches. You can find that as an installment of the Charlotte Ledger podcast. We put the audio uh, out, of that, um, out of that meeting last week. Um, but you can find that on the Charlotte Ledger podcast, wherever you download podcasts, if you listen to podcasts. As I mentioned, this webinar series is the result of a collaboration between Catapult and the Charlotte Ledger. Catapult leverages six, uh, I'm sorry, Catapult leverages 65 years of HR experience to serve more than 2,000 employers across North Carolina and beyond. Catapult's HR and business experts help employers address immediate and long-term challenges with customized solutions, trusted advice, exclusive resources, data-driven insights, and a vibrant member community. You can learn more about Catapult at letscatapult.org. The Charlotte Ledger is a digital publication that delivers smart, original, business-minded news and insights for Charlotte, primarily through an assortment of email newsletters. We think Charlotte deserves more relevant and credible sources of information, and we're working to build that. And if that sounds good to you, you can find out more about the Charlotte Ledger and sign up for our newsletters at thecharlotteledger.com. Today, we're having a discussion with Kendra Stewart of Catapult. Kendra L. Stewart's passion has always been figuring out complex problems as a consultant for people to help empower their business and professional development. She has over 25 years leading HR initiatives in multiple industries, including technology, energy, services, and healthcare. And she has expertise in talent development, workforce planning, strategic HR implementation, and management consultation. Uh, she likes to joke that she knows enough to be dangerous in every HR function, but not so dangerous to, quote, end up in jail. So we're happy you straddle that uh, balance there, uh, Kendra. Uh, Kendra holds a master's in HR management and organizational development from Loyola University in Chicago, a bachelor's in biology from the University of Michigan, as well as professional certifications, and she is based in Charlotte. And as I mentioned, Kendra and I are going to have a discussion for about 20 minutes, and then we'll definitely leave time for your questions. And if you have questions, put them in the chat and, and we will get to them. We're going to talk today about recruiting and retention questions, such as how to find qualified workers in a tight job market, how recruiting has changed over the years, and how to keep workers motivated and incentivized, or hopefully leave you with some good tips and strategies that you can use. So Kendra, uh, welcome. Hi, thanks. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, it should be fun. Uh, let's start with a general question. What's going on right now with the labor market and the demand for workers, and how is that affecting businesses? Yeah, we've seen that there's been um, a lot that our members, especially Tony, have um, kind of been saying a lot of the same things. I mean, definitely, hands down, one of the biggest areas that I think that we hear from a lot of our members and then just from other employers across the Carolinas and that we support and hear from is uh, primarily, you know, they're having trouble getting talent for, you know, pay. It's a competitive environment, um, as I'm sure you can understand. There's a number of people who are just really struggling to be able to compete and find people and figure out what's the best incentive to, you know, draw people in. Um, another area, too, I think we hear a lot about is flexibility, and that comes in many different avenues. I mean, one that I think that comes to mind uh, that we hear about quite a bit is flexibility, particularly with schedules. You know, what used to be um, working schedules that organizations could fill uh, and didn't have any problems being able to fill now are all of a sudden, you know, finding to be some of the hardest things that people can kind of keep people in, in place for. Um, so we're seeing that there's a lot of struggle in a lot of the same areas across multiple different industries. Um, and I think everybody is starting to feel that pain. I mean, I, I'm curious too, to see, we have a lot of folks that I was excited to see have jumped on if others are having, or if anybody would be willing to share as far as what are some of those talent struggles that folks would be willing to share on the line. 
if anybody would be anybody interested. care to jump in put you on the spot <laughs> well i know from. i know coming from um landscaping as far as hardscapes and regular maintenance you can't find any people who want to work today you know unfortunately enough they do want to work they want to be started at 20 21 dollars an hour yeah yeah i mean the shortage period of just finding people i mean a lot of these conversations that we have surprisingly are you know in rural areas too so you know we're you know the last time that i had this exact same conversation it was in a very rural county, um, about an hour and a half outside of Charlotte. And their biggest issue was they had trouble finding, you know, CDL drivers and, um, you know, power folks that could work in the utilities industry. So a lot of folks are finding that, like, it doesn't matter where they are. We had other people that were there for that conversation. Um, they're having the same difficulty. And that's definitely one, just the talent just doesn't seem to A, want to show up to apply and be when they do they're expecting a lot more money absolutely anything else i'm curious what else others are, are are kind of hearing to see if it's very similar to what we've been hearing as well i work at a nonprofit in charlotte and we're hearing we're experiencing the same thing they do they want an enormous more money than we can ever afford to pay um and they don't want to do what they need to do in their roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, I'm just so, curious, what do you do about that? How do you address that? We move on. I mean, we just, being a nonprofit, there's not much we can do in terms of salary. Um, as far as their roles, we look for creative <laughs> ways to make that more appealing, um, but really it stops with the salary that we're able to provide. I can imagine that you you probably are seeing a lot of people coming and going, you know, as a result yeah. of that, or even being able to get over the hump of finding people, you know, in a market where your your competition is people not necessarily coming from nonprofit as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's people that are just demanding probably much more, you know, if not double, uh, you know, what we have. We have a lot of members that are also nonprofit, so we do hear that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so Kendra, let me ask you, I mean, what sort of things are, are you hearing from employers? You talk to a lot of employers. Is this, is it really pretty desperate? I mean, what, I mean, are these, what we're hearing today, you know, from some of the people on, on this webinar, is that, is that pretty common? And I mean, what are the, what are the implications there for these businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think hands down, you know, when they, when folks are coming online, especially, and then, you know, sharing all of these, these stories that they have about their struggles. I mean, I think there is, you know, a level of desperation, particularly for depending upon the industry, um, particular jobs, right, that they might have been stretched on and, and not have been able to fill for a while. I mean, there are some people that are coming that have had jobs that have been open for months, if not years. Um, and so I think the struggle is definitely um, real and it is out there. And I think folks are really trying to figure out what is a better way for us to be able to find this talent and bring people in. Um, and we have a lot of information today, I think that we would be able to share not only that we're getting from multiple different industries, but just different ways to maybe think about how we can help and um, different ways to think about how you might be able to get this talent and then also maybe retain them as well. <clears throat> so what is the answer? I'm guessing, and I'm just seeing a comment here from Beth in the chat that says, we are also a nonprofit and in essence stuck with fixed hourly rates to offer no negotiating room. So, I mean, this is does seem like a widespread problem. Will you tell us that you have the magic bullet, simple solution to solve all of these problems? Wish that I could say that we have a magic bullet, um, but unfortunately we don't. But I will say is we have, and there's a lot of different ways, I think, and a lot of the most important thing is to probably know what the data is, you know, what's out there today, understand a little bit more about the market. I think the benefit that we have at Catapult is that we are here behind um, our members as well as non-members with a lot of information that helps you to be able to understand what are the trends, which helps to answer, I think, some of these questions around what are these pain points that everybody's feeling in different ways. And we're going to be able to hopefully help provide you with some other alternatives, right, to maybe what you've done before or what you're experiencing in order to hopefully be able to um, 
provide different ways for you to be able to, to get that talent in and keep them. Yeah. So, so what are some of those things? What, what are, or maybe what is the mindset or what is the way of thinking about this that would be helpful in, in approaching some of these issues? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, and, and actually um, if we go to the next slide, it might be even helpful or more helpful. You know, a lot of what we're hearing from people, it's not our imagination. I mean, this is very real. And honestly, while it feels like symptoms when you are within an organization, um, it's all facts, folks. I mean, if you take a look, a lot of what you have here are real facts that have come through from, um, you know, the <clears throat> manpower group and the Department of Labor. And what we're finding is that there's talent shortages everywhere in the U.S. I mean, it has quintupled in the last 10 years. 75% of employers are struggling to fill their positions, and that's up 14% since 2010. So in a very short period of time, I mean, you know, a little bit over a decade, we're finding that a lot has changed for us. And it's not just for the United States. This is a global talent shortage that we're starting to get into. And by 2030, as you can see here, we're going to see that there's going to be a talent shortage of about 85.2 million people. I mean, at the end of the day, <clears throat> in the job report here, the unemployment rate is great. I mean, it's fallen, as you can see, from 3%. It was estimated to be 3.6. It's one of the lowest jobless levels that we've seen since 69, 1969. But yeah, just like some of the folks that we've heard already on the phone, we're struggling. I mean, payrolls are up. People are fighting to try to be competitive and to be able to pay people at the highest rates that they can. And that's far higher than what the estimate actually was. As you can see, it's 517,000 that it's increased for most payrolls versus there was only an estimate of around 187,000. So, I mean, what does it mean? Despite the fact that there's, you know, obviously a lot of strong job growth, I mean, we're seeing that it's just not going to go away. There's not enough people that we're going to find and it's going to continue to trend that way in the job market to fill essentially all of the recruiting needs and demands that we have. So this is kind of the state of our talent that, that we're seeing today. I'm just curious, what are the implications of this for technology? You know, we've seen a lot of artificial intelligence, you know, there are more and more productivity tools coming online. I mean, is this, can we, you know, invent tech to get out of this? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting that you say that, Tony, and, and there's plenty more, too, I think, that we can talk about um, later on when we get into more detail about what are the things that you can do. But yes, technology can be helpful. But, you know, I like to always tell people you want to start with and take a look holistically at what are you doing within your business? Yes, technology comes with a lot of bells and whistles, but it's also very expensive, right, for your business to be able to invest in that. And oftentimes, it's good to take a step back to understand holistically what is your whole recruiting and <clears throat> retention strategy within your company. If you haven't started maybe with the basics of what are you doing and are you doing it well, then bringing in talent and, and you know, technology is maybe not the best way to start, right, to be able to um, gain talent. So, like, let me give you an example. I, I've worked with a company a few years back um, during, you know, my time of consulting and um, they were interested in bringing in um, the staff that was field staff. So they were going to be hourly workers. Um, you know, this organization, very similar to what you described, Tony, was very into, you know, wanting to use AI, wanting to bring in chat and all this new technology that, you know, they had been seeing and hearing about um, and, you know, bringing in all these bots, chat, AI chat bots and things like that, that could, you know, be uh tagged on to their um, system in order to be able to hopefully talk to candidates and things like that. But what we found when we kind of took a look deeper is that when they did consider bringing them in, their basics just weren't in place. So as an example, you know, when this chat pulls people from, I don't know, let's say their Facebook page, right? Um, and they're scraping people from all these different places on the internet. What that company found is, okay, you got them there, but then it would send them to their company website to fill out an application that was pages and pages long. And so therefore they were losing all of these people with this wonderful technology that they had, which was kind of a waste of time and money. So the question is, is before you get that technology, 
think a little bit about what are you doing and maybe how can you improve the processes that you have. Sometimes it's about thinking differently rather than going after the bells and whistles with the basics that you have. Okay, let's dig in on that. How do, how do I, if I'm a business, how do I think differently? What are some creative ways or, or some potential solutions? Yeah, so the biggest thing that I always tell and like to think about for folks is, you know, you ask yourself the question then, um, what, what is your candidate experience, right? So let's start from there as an example. Um, one of the things that uh, we actually, there was a survey, I think, that came from LinkedIn that said about 67% of most of the candidates that apply on LinkedIn, as an example, usually don't finish the application process. And that's just because of the fact that it's too cumbersome. So let's take a step back as an example. Before you start moving to technology, this is what I mean about take a look at the technology that you have, your ATS systems, your recruiting systems, and how you're doing it. Is it duplicated? Do you have a candidate have to repeat a number of things over and over again? Um, is it even you know electronic? Is it mobile friendly? Is it something that a person can do from their phone without having to you know do it from their phone, drop, and then end up going to a computer as an example? These are things that you might need to take a look at in order to maybe consider, I need to change these things. And these are things that are easy, simple, low hanging fruit things that I can do um, that would end up being able to make it a little bit easier. I mean, another thing is, you know, we live in a world that's full of Amazon related project, products, right? I mean, you go to Amazon, you get communicated to about where your package is every five minutes if you want to. And I mean, that's what employees are looking for as well when it comes to, are you able to communicate how you're doing, how fast the recruiting process is? And that doesn't necessarily take technology. How often are you getting back to people? How clear and transparent are you being about what the process is? How prepared are your interviewers, right? Are you all setting up time in order to make sure that the people who come know what they should be interviewing for, know what they should be focused on, or are they unprepared and not quite sure what to ask the candidate and causing confusion? These sorts of things are all examples of what you could do differently, right? That could get in depth, that you could change if you haven't already done it in order to put yourself in a better place for how you pull in that talent and how you make the experience better and faster and a little bit more efficient so that you can keep that talent when you have them apply for jobs. Yeah, that's sounds, maybe one good example. It sounds like you're saying sort of get your own house in order, make it easy to apply, sort of give them, a you know, establish a clear process, a clear vision. Those sorts of things can help, I, I'm, I'm guessing. At the same time, you know, it strikes me, we have a lot of ways nowadays to reach people maybe that we didn't before. In the old days, maybe you'd take out a classified ad or something like that. And nowadays, we got all this, all these digital tools. You know, you got ZipRecruiter, you got Indeed, you got LinkedIn. I mean, how do I, how do I know what to, I mean, you can, it seems like you can cast a pretty broad net, but people are saying, well, I'm not getting the quality of candidates that I am accustomed to getting. It seems like there's a little bit of a mismatch there. What are some of the the, the actual tactics about the outreach and finding finding folks. What are what are some you know best uh, best ways of doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a two pronged approach, right? I think you got to think about um, how are you looking for candidates. One of the biggest things that I think we like to also remind people of is to consider taking a step back. What are you even presenting to candidates to apply for? You know, take a look. We often tell people, what's in your job description? What was the last time you actually looked at the description that you use as a posting? I mean, these days you're going up against like, uh, you know, a lot of really great competitors and they've got their marketing, <laughs> you know, departments that are writing all these swanky, cool sort of job descriptions in order to really pull people in. And, and you should do that too. If you have not taken a look at how you're drawing people in with interesting things about your company, interesting benefits that would grab all generations as an example, um, things that you could do differently and things that are within your power to be able to do in order to pull talent, then that's one really strong, simple way you can do it. So as an example, um, you know, there's a lot of companies that have started to put as far as what, what their summary is for their organization, all the great things that they offer, and they do it so that hopefully they can catch and pull in people generationally. Um, I've heard of a lot of companies these days as an example that 
are starting to put in that they are starting to pay as a benefit for some of the educational expenses for com for organizations. I mean, that's something for somebody who just got out of college is really important, right? Um, but on the flip side, also, what are some of the other benefits that you might be able to draw people in with? There's others that are in different generations where the first thing that might be important is 401k, right? Retirement or I mean, maybe even making sure that you let people know you pay a certain amount of medical premiums that maybe other organizations competitively aren't able to do. So highlighting what are the benefits that would capture and be able to, um, you know, impact as many people as possible can be very, very important to a large number of people. So I would always say start with job descriptions as a very important tool to maybe take a look at to try to figure out what can you do different and how are you drawing people in with it? Um, and then also considering what can you do as far as letting people know about all the great benefits that you do have that would be able to draw people in and hopefully be able to keep them as well. Yeah, and you touched on generational differences in writing job descriptions in a way that appeals to all generations. And we had a question from Beth who says, I hope, I'm hoping you can touch on generational differences in terms of expectations for new work or new to the workforce. And you know, what, what are some of those differences? What, why do people, and I know you, you hate to generalize and people have their own reasons for taking jobs, but I do think surveys do show there is a generational shift, um, you know, that people in their twenties, you know, it's, it's a different experience and want things out of their job that maybe, maybe people in their fifties, um, you know, wouldn't have thought to, to ask for. What, what are some of those generational differences? And if you're, Posting a job, recruiting for a job, hoping to retain workers. What are some of those things you should keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, I think, too, the biggest thing is that for a lot of the generations that are probably younger, one of the things that we're seeing and trending um, amongst members is that they're asking for, again, a lot of things that would only be specific to, as an example, somebody who might be in their 20s and what's important. So I think um, from a total rewards perspective, it's important to take a step back and take a look at what can we offer that's realistic. Um, if there's more than one way that you can give an incentive to people in order to help younger generations, and that's better. So like as an example, I used paying, there are companies that are starting to trend toward paying off some of their educational bills. If that's not, um, you know, the other thing is rather than offering, you know, medical for some people, I, literally, we've been in some um, organizations where they said for a lot of the folks in their 20s, when they actually asked um, and the younger generations, the most important thing to them is pay my cell phone bill. That's, you know, I'm on the phone the most. That's the most important thing to me. And I mean, you can understand from an organization's perspective, paying a cell phone bill off every month is probably a lot less expensive than paying the medical bill, if that's the most important thing. So, I mean, it all depends on I think also getting a chance to have retention strategies around talk to your employees, have these conversations. And then on the flip side, you know, once you get that information and that feedback about what you're hearing that your employees want, the other thing too is think about how much autonomy for you as leaders or for your leaders that maybe you can give back to leaders to be able to allow them the opportunity to give people some of this flexibility, right? So it's different if, you know, one size, we're in a place, as I'm sure you understand, Tony, where one size doesn't fit all anymore, just like we're talking about. You know, somebody, baby boomers have started to retire. Gen Xers are maybe getting to the point where 401k and some other things are more important. And again, there might be younger generations that just doesn't find it as, as easy. Something more simple would make them happier and actually keep them on for, you know, an extra year or however longer that you would like to, you know, try to retain these people. So it's important to see if you can provide the autonomy to leaders so that when they have these conversations, if it's simplistic things that you can do just to be able to retain your person and keep them there, what we're finding is the biggest thing based on these trends that we just talked about is there's just not going to be enough people in the workforce. So rather than working on what you can do to recruit people, the more important conversation and the more important focus is focusing on how you retain people. And that's through having conversations. That's through being able to have the autonomy to, to give people these little things, if you can, that makes them happy, that gets them to stay. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Makes sense to me. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat and, and we will get to them. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, try and be flexible to the extent you can. Don't just have a one size fits all policy, but really listen to your workers or potential workers, hear what's important to them. And if, if you're able to kind of adjust, then do that. And I definitely do want to talk about the the retaining, the retention um, part as well, because just like finding the difference between going out and finding a new customer versus you know retaining an existing a customer it's a lot easier to retain your existing customer a lot less expensive than to go out and hunt for new ones same with employees if you have a good yeah. one you know retaining them so is it the same sort of thing like you know listening to them saying listen what what do you value what is it that you need from us and and one of the things I've been reading about, and Kendra, maybe you can touch on this, is that you know that that pay, while pay is important, it's not as important maybe as we have thought it has been in previous decades, and that nowadays folks, a lot of them are looking for things like meaning. They want to do some meaningful work. They want to have responsibility, but not too much responsibility. They want that you know work life balance as opposed to being on the clock all the time. What yeah. what are some what are some things if if I have good employees, what do I need to do to make sure they don't leave me? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're 100% you're right, Tony. I mean, you can go and look Gallup, um, a number of different polls, and you will see that almost every poll that you could take a look at you know, every single year, just about money is not the top thing that keeps people. The top thing is always going to be having those conversations, development, um, you know, employee and development these days doesn't just necessarily mean professional development either. Being able to help people, you know, whether it be personally, um, you know, from a mental health perspective or even from a professional and personal perspective in their growth is very important. And just like what you talked about, you know, from certain generations, certain things could be more meaningful to them. So being able to provide and have conversations to understand from your employee, what are the things that they feel that they need to be able to grow and what can you offer to them are important. I mean, I think the other thing too, uh, when you're talking about, you know, the subject of having conversations with employees, sometimes having something as simple, oftentimes we wait until an employee is out the door, right? They've turned in their notice already and we've kind of lost them before we start to reflect on what is it that we've could have done differently and what is it that maybe has gone wrong or that we need to know for next time. Um, but we have a lot of companies that uh, have started to move to having stay interviews, which I'm sure a lot of folks um, have heard of before. I mean, I was just recently at another um, event where I had a company that had a really great exit interview, I mean, excuse me, stay interview process where they literally every six months, I think they said they do a pulse survey. Uh, very simplistic. It's not anything where you need to have, you know, a big like a culture amp or some big organization that can come in and do it for you. And essentially they asked them um, three questions. <laughs> have you thought about leaving? And if they have thought about leaving, um, why? And if they say no, then the last question is, um, what made you stay? In order to figure out, like, what are the reasons behind what are we doing right, right, in order to keep the people here? So sometimes having these conversations is the most important thing because we're finding that the trends are showing that it's just going to be harder. I mean, you said it yourself, Tony, a second ago um, that, you know, these days, the new statistic for, again, not the training side, not the orientation side, this is strictly 100% recruiting. It is still, um, one half to two times the amount of a person's salary to recruit and replace them. So, I mean, you just think, I mean, let's do simple math, a hundred thousand dollar job, you know, that could be anywhere from, you know, 50,000 to $200,000 just to replace one job. You're already in the hole, right? On top of the annual salary that you have to pay. It just doesn't pay anymore for us to only concentrate on how we recruit, we've got to spend more time on thinking about what are all the different alternatives in order to keep people in, because we're going to get to a job market, unfortunately, where there's just not enough people to fill the job. So the best thing to do is to try to retain the folks that you have. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting to see, you know, the way different employers are doing, doing that and trying to create that culture where people want to stay. I was at Camp North End, uh, last week, I was interviewing somebody, I meet them there 
four o'clock or four thirty. Software company at Camp North End. I walk in, and every Thursday at four o'clock. And this is a, the tech industry is sort of notorious for this, but you know, they had like beer taps, you know, they, everybody's drinking beer. They had some, you know, nachos and they had, you know, a taco bar. And, uh, and I was talking to a guy and I start hearing this thud, thud. I'm like, what is that? I said, oh, they're playing cornhole upstairs. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. there's this, this is at four o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday. And I mean, to a lot of people that would be like, well, what, why are we doing, why are we doing this? This is kind of new. Do I really need to have cornhole and beer at four o'clock on Thursdays? And that's not going to be right for every employer, obviously. But what are some things that I can do as an employer to try to, you know, create that culture, uh, you know, that this, whether it's esprit de corps or whether it's some sort of a we're all in this together? Or what are some ways to to create a positive culture in, in businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, let's talk about some different sort of alternatives. You know, a lot of us are starting to go remote these days. I think for remote companies, it's, it, you know, simple enough to just be able to pull your team together to try to put something like that together for remote teams. I mean, I've seen, and I think a lot of people may have even seen on LinkedIn sometimes where teams will get together on, um, you know, their teams, um, their teams platform and have like a team's party of some sorts where, you know, they're going around the horn and doing something to celebrate. Um, the other thing too, that we're finding is having more flexibility, right? For remote staff and also doing more to just bring them together so that they have a closer relationship. Sometimes that's what's important, but again, asking your team what it is that they want to do, just like what you're describing for that particular organization, that could work. I mean, I've seen in manufacturing environments, as an example, you know, I talked earlier where a lot of people said they have a lot of problems with flexibility of schedules. One of the things that um, we had one company do, they were having trouble with filling schedules and, and being able to get people to come to work for hourly staff. They went from just from asking questions and taking a poll of what people could work and what they wanted to try to work. They went from, you know, a very fixed schedule program of around four, I think, or five schedules to, yes, it was a little bit of a nightmare to try to logistically to get it set up, but they went to, I think, 16 to 20 schedules, but they were able to have every single job filled. They had a constant workforce going. They always had 100% of their jobs filled. They, they eliminated the problem of having to recruit and find people to fill those because of the fact that they thought differently and they asked their employees for help on what they could do. So it is possible in multiple different um, industries, I think, and in different examples. A lot of it has to do with pulling in your staff, right? And just seeing what is in it for them and what works best for them. And then again, autonomy for your leaders on what they can do. Gotcha. I see that Bree has a question that she put in the chat. Bree, if uh, if you want to go ahead and ask that, you can ask that. If not, I'll read it. Thanks, Tony. Um, my question is basically, so um, I have a remote company. Um, all our staff is contractors, so it's a little bit different. So we don't have benefits and things like that. Um, but as far as the retention goes, um, like doing surveys, things like that is are those things that normally you'd have for like a W-2 employee could, I mean, I know it would have to shift a little bit, but would those be things that we could implement as far as contractors too? Because you really don't have that like, you know, W-2 requirement and things like that. And they're technically independent contractors and um, can make their own schedules. And there's a lot of legal, you know, minutia between W-2 and 1099s mm -hmm. just trying to kind of take that retention and turn it into from a contractor standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question, Bree. I think, um, you know, just to be able to capture, you know, your contractors, whether it's versus a W-2 or a 1099 person, I think just to be able to keep them engaged, there's absolutely no problem with also being able to ask them what are the things that they would like to see done differently, whether it be for work processes, because at the end of the day, they're still involved in your work processes, right? So whether it be for um, operational related things you want to ask or just ways for them to get to know the team better or be more engaged, I think that it's a great opportunity to be able to a survey. And, and you don't even have to feel like you have to survey. I mean, Again, don't always think that you have to go to bells and whistles in order to be able to achieve things with basics. So sometimes just sitting down and, and having like a focus group where you're just asking the question, right, as a leader, 
um, of your team or the next time that you have one-on-ones, just being active and thoughtful about asking the same questions in order to try to get at what are things that employees would like to see or have done would be able to help you, you know, even be able to retrain to retain your contractors as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we're almost at 40 minutes. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to, to drop them um, into, the, into the chat. Um, Kendra, are there any other things we haven't touched on that you're hearing a lot about, the common questions that you get, anything like that? I mean, I think the the biggest thing that folks always have is that, you know, you, you, you're you in your microcosm of your own organization. So you always are thinking like, you know, it can't be any worse than this particular problem or situation that I have. But I think it's good to be on calls like this for our folks to understand that this is not just an individual problem. This is very real and it's a very factual problem that's impacting all of us. So in whatever way that you can, A, think differently. So again, I think the biggest question is, question, you know, ask yourself, if you had to ask a candidate or you were a candidate in your organization, what do you think the experience can, A, what is it like? What would they say about it? And B, what could you change about it? Like that's the one question. The second thing is your onboarding experience. Remember, Orientation on the first day is not onboarding. And like we talked about, a lot of employees, one of the number one things that keeps them um, and, and also recruits people in is how you treat them, how you develop them. Onboarding is key. It's one of the main things that keeps people. If you do not have a strong onboarding experience, it's been proven that people will probably leave. So you wanna ask that question, right? And then the last one, the, the third and the fourth one is, again, we've talked a lot about what are the different incentives you can do? How can you be an employer of choice? And that comes down to thinking about benefits, transparency as much as you can with communications to people about what you're doing and, and how you're trying to be the best employer that you can be, um, you know, providing work-life balance or whatever it is that people are asking, right, for to the extent that you can. I know you can't provide everything, but what's feasible, right? And then the fourth one is, how are you adapting? So think back about all of these different things that we've talked about. Put yourself and your organization in that microcosm and in that box and ask yourself, have we changed? Are we still doing some things that we can improve on? What can I do about it as an individual or as a leadership team or a leader myself? And think about ways in which you can probably hopefully make those improvements or bring those improvements forward. Great. Well, I think that's a good note to end it on. Uh, appreciate it, Kendra. Thanks a lot. Pleasure to be here. And just wanted to give another um, shout out. We'll do, we'll do one more webinar next week, May 24th. It's called Build Your Benefits Package, Exploring Healthcare <laughs> Options. It's a Q&A uh, with Martha Barker, Catapult Benefit Solutions Manager. And you can sign up for that the same place that you signed up uh, for this webinar, letscatapult.org. Uh, on behalf of the Charlotte Ledger and Catapult, thank you for joining us.